Good evening. My lectures to date have been about perpetrators of crimes in war, international war crimes, their lawyers and judges. This lecture is about regulation as it operates for lawyers, especially barristers and judges, and I'm going to view it from different angles, hopefully allowing for conclusions or questions at the end, incorporating personal experiences that will, I hope, bring some of the problems to life. Regulation, like law itself, is a set of rules with sanctions for those who break them. But it's not just a question of forbidding things from being done. It also requires and encourages action. Recent regulatory changes for barristers have sought to make the bar more available to the public, freeing barristers to work in organisations that are much like solicitors' firms. But the complexity of regulation with a super-regulator overseeing the work of eight regulators, each regulating a segment of the legal profession by boards that have to have a lay majority, has proved uncomfortable to many and drawn criticisms from practitioners involved and from the subordinate regulators themselves. Exploring successes and failings of regulation in our barrister's little profession leads to thinking about what law, lawyers and judges really do. There's much to learn. We regulate professionals. That's, I didn't need to get there. No, nope, I missed out a, a slide. Never mind, we'll come to him in a second. We regulate professionals because we need to be able to trust them. The doctor who says you won't die, the architect who says the roof won't fall in on your children's bedroom, are both people you need to trust. Curiously different from the priest who is unregulated, but whom you take on trust, although he too, or she too, deals with life and death. Now, our own legal system, the best in the world, as it is often enough claimed, has been regulated by judges controlling barristers since Edward I's time, and for the last seven years, the Independent Bar Standards Board has dealt with discipline and regulation. 41 years ago, when I came to the bar, it was a small profession with about 6,000 practitioners, mostly men, mostly working as self-employed referral barristers in cooperative organisations called chambers. I can recall nothing of formal education about regulatory rules as they would now be described. There was a rule book handed out when we were called to the bar. I found mine. It was unread. We picked up ethics from our pupillage and on the job. The profession is much larger now, 16,000 with 5,000 working as employed barristers. When I started, control of barristers and of judicial conduct was largely or frequently informal, and this is how it operated. First, a profession of a few thousand barrister advocates in independent practice was highly gossipy. Make a mistake in Swansea today, and tomorrow it could be the talk of the profession in robing rooms in Norwich or Newcastle. Make an ethical blunder or do something perceived as dodgy or dishonest, and your name could be muddied for life with your career damaged or even destroyed. Barristers were aware of what would happen to their reputation if they put a foot out of line, and all they had to sell was their reputations. Today's much larger bar may have left this mechanism less effective. Second, there were the rules, there still are, by which the barrister can refer to what he's doing and check whether it's right or wrong. Third, we were, maybe we still are, a form of elite. The profession was not excessively bourgeois by background in 1970s because local authority grants could see us through university without debt and pay for the year at bar school. I got through to the first six months of pupillage without any debt at all and you can always cover the first six months by working at a different form of bar if you want to. Um, there were very few women and they often found it extremely hard to be treated as equals. But the elite society to which I refer once entered was not marked by wealth, earned or otherwise, or even merely by intelligence. If we were an elite, it was by being elite in the way that especially daring military groups are described as elite or crack, such as the SAS on the one hand and President Gaddafi's elite guard of women on the other. Where elitism of this kind exists in a good group, the one on the left, 
not perhaps the one on the right. If I am roughly right, the member cannot face himself in the mirror if she or he fails to meet the standards of the group, even if he or she would not be caught out. When this spirit operates within a group, it, it serves the public interest. It should be encouraged, harnessed, bred from. My reckoning was that it did operate when I first came to the bar to a significant extent. Pride at being members of an elite meant we had to honour its code if we were to be happy with ourselves, and I'll come back to this. Before doing that, I should acknowledge that the legal system, when I started, did feel different from how it seems today. It was a masculine profession, with many who'd served in the war robust, red-blooded, sexist often enough, racist, with some real shockers of judges on the bench, along with some very, very decent judges, many of them. The shockers might enjoy destroying counsel for sport, or more commonly, controlling a jury to be sure that the defendant was convicted. Potted was the word that was and still is used of such judges. In criminal courts, there could be the sense that the judge and the prosecution were on the same side. I have sat as a part-time judge for nearly 30 years in various capacities, and I've felt it change. All judges go to residential training courses every year. And yet, within the last 20 years, at one such course, a recently retired, very, very senior judge repeated somebody else's joke coming from an earlier sentencing seminar concerning a girl raped at Cambridge, a fictional case, saying that instead of giving her five or six years, their group had given him a blue. He had no idea how the world had changed. One of his predecessors, of course, a Lord Chief Justice, no less, again in my lifetime, prepared a report into Bloody Sunday that at the best is described as a greywash, that it took decades and millions of pounds to put right, some say with an increase in terrorist violence. What will we say of a Lord Chief Justice south of the Sahara preparing a grey wash or whitewash on government activity? We have to be honest about the legal society from which we are now uh, emerging. Legal systems, even the best in the world, like large ships, need time to change course. We hope these things of which I speak are largely in the past. Selection of judges has become much more professional and systematic, and for the most part, inappropriately inclined judges should be eliminated at interview by experienced professionals. Second, some at least of the motivation for getting defendants potted was a belief that some procedures of the law benefited those who were or may have been guilty, but who got acquitted under the proof beyond reasonable doubt rule by reason of some technicality. Over time, many of these procedures and laws have been abolished as a matter of policy, and there may be less now the sense that the legal system is loaded in favour of the potentially guilty. There are three examples that the printed version has more detail. The peremptory challenge of jurors, which enabled you to load a jury in favour of your type of defendant, that's gone. The right to silence has gone. You can comment on it pretty well in every area. And also corroboration for sex, children and family offences, gone. Third, jurors have become less in awe of courts and more willing to ask questions. Although judges are trained to discourage too many jury questions, it may be one feature among many that make judges actually more and more happy to give verdicts fairly, to leave verdicts fairly to juries. It is a long time since I recall any judge bemoaning a jury's decision until, as you may remember, the somewhat surprising outburst from the bench in the Vicky Price trial. As long as these changes were underway and the profession was growing in size, much regulation and control of behaviour was informal. Let me explain how it operated. First with um, uh, a story about a judge, true story. It's in the, it's in the printed version in greater detail, but what it came to was this. I was defending a chap who should undoubtedly go to prison for a few years as being a professional burglar. A couple of policemen from London had a private audience with the judge. Lovely bloke, gentle as could be, uh, part-time judge, academic from Cambridge. 
And so as opposed to getting four or five years, having had a private negotiation, he got a suspended sentence. Great for my bloke, but wrong. The judge was doing something that was already known to be wrong. What should I do? What should the others do? Report him? No. You had an informal approach. My head of chambers agreed that this chap needed a bit of help. And it was all done behind the scenes. Goodwill, it worked. And of course, more commonly, it worked the other way. Um, by an approach that didn't harm anyone, the judge would see the barrister doing something unsatisfactory and would send an informal message. That was a method of regulation. Don't knock it. It's quite good when it works. More commonly, of course, um, sorry, the old-fashioned bar that was passing can be seen in echo or reprise in outposts of empire, or a little bit nearer, Jersey, where I was a part-time judge a few years ago. What I experienced showed several things about regulation of lawyers and, indeed, ultimately, of judges. Jersey has a rather different system for trials where two jurats, the island's most senior elected officials, sit with the judge. The jurats are effectively professional jurors who will have read the papers in advance. In the case we were dealing with, there were 12 lever arch files. It was a financial case. The judge deals with procedure and directs the jurats publicly about the law, but then has to retire with them when they consider their verdict. But he has no part to play in the factual decisions, unless they happen to be split. Another part-time judge in Jersey told me that retiring with the jurats gave you an opportunity to help them with their decision, i.e to indicate what they should decide. I'd already started to wonder how, when it came for me to retire with my jurats, I could avoid the situation, the temptation described, where I would be drawn into the factual decision-making process. Apparently, I wasn't allowed to leave them alone, although I did as much as I possibly could to ensure they spoke freely. And I devised a scheme, no doubt little liked by counsel, as it involved additional work and maybe especially disliked by the prosecution were they to have assumed that good judges helped jurats. Where for each of the many allegations on the indictment, a chart should be prepared by the advocates. Most criminal offences have two elements, what happens, the state of mind of the accused, and the advocates on all sides in this two-defendant case set out their half-dozen best points for each element of each offence. This was in addition to oral and written closing arguments. If in deliberation it became clear that the jurats were stuck on any count in the indictment and minded to turn to me for guidance, I could reflect their independence and my genuine disengagement from their factual decision-making by inviting them simply to remind themselves of the route to decision that each side had proposed. Of course, I cannot possibly tell you what happened in the retiring room. I can tell you from my personal experience that I would unhesitatingly recommend this scheme to any others trying similar cases in similar circumstances. And the reason I tell you this is this tells us something about regulation. It happens to be regulation of judge and jurats, but of general application. Systems can easily, this was a system I devised, systems can easily deflect well-intentioned people subject to temptation from taking a wrong step. And it is not at all different, indeed it's very similar, to the, practices, the practice that's developed over the last 20 years, 40, 30 years, in England and Wales with summings up, where judges are expected to, to use and to adapt standard approved forms of words for particular offences or particular modes of liability. They are also encouraged, in all but the simplest cases, to provide a jury with directions that constitute a logical route to verdict, one way or another. These devices, systems, not just rules, not just a rule book, systems, have of course rendered it much harder for a judge to pot a defendant by a slanted summing up and encourage him to leave the jury to their job and to do his own. I forgot incidentally to show you this picture of old fashioned law Brothers-in-law on the left, Rumpole on the right. Let's move on to regulation at work or not. And let me give you a second 
true life example, not true life, life example, my own. <coughs> this time I was representing a chap charged with death by reckless driving. Um, there'd been a night of wild excess where a number of youths had nicked lots of cars, crashed them, and in the end, tragically, somebody, not a driver, had been killed. All the young men ran away, and all bar my chap turned up at the police station in sequence and said, my chap did it. He said he didn't, and there was no other evidence. When I got to court, prosecuting counsel seemed rather keen to exert pressure through me on my client to plead guilty. But my client wouldn't have it. So the case was adjourned for a trial. Prosecuting counsel didn't seem very keen to be available for the trial. And so when I came back on the next occasion, another barrister walked up to me with a piece of paper in his hand and said, you see this? What it was a witness statement from the arms of one of the other young men, to whom that young man, her nephew, had confessed on the very morning of the death that he was the driver. She got to the police immediately and handed over the statement. And yet, prosecuting counsel, the first time, had not shown it to me. Prosecuting counsel, on the second, had. Well, before long, the chat. There was a pretty tepid form of inquiry. The barrister prosecuting wasn't really called to account. Things are absolutely different now. And we simply have to recognise that some people will not follow the rules. This book had a very substantial practice working for the customs and excise, prosecuting for cases, for drugs cases. A few years later, he left the country. Why? Because he'd been involved in a bad fraud on his own country. A third case, not favourable to me, comes from shortly before the time when I was about to receive the envelope from the Lord Chancellor saying whether I had or had not become a QC, a real high point in a barrister's life, if the answer is yes. I was prosecuting a man with charged with serious sexual offences against two young children, each of whom gave evidence. The judge, I fear, was notoriously one of those who liked to what defendants. And indeed, I heard him say, I can get them done, keep them. He sat the case up and the jury convicted. Muffled bells started to sound. Had the judge summed up the children's evidence correctly? Well, the judge would be going right and defence took no point. But the muffled bells in my head would not go away. The letter arrived. Yes! I've been successful. But by now the pleasure was diminished by anxiety and doubt. Effort to silence the bells failed, and so eventually I sent for the transcript, checked the law, found that the bells had been right, the judge had erred. I wrote to the defence counsel, he thanked me, the man was in due course of prison. Had I checked to know the risky judge more carefully at trial, I could have corrected the summing up, the man might have stayed in prison. Why, in the end, did I guarantee myself weeks or months of misery and self doubt? until the appeal court hearing was done. Was I worried about being found out? Possible but unlikely, because I never thought the case was going on appeal and if it had, it might have covered this territory. And even if it had, this particular issue could have been said to be, well, everybody missed it, so maybe not that bad. But I may have been worried, I hope not. Why did I eventually respond? Maybe in part for the reason I gave at the start, or a little earlier the inability to face myself in the mirror if I did not do what I knew I had to. Even then, and especially now that I was apparently um, approved as a QC. Incidentally, the rule that the judge broke in his summing up was one of those that was swept away shortly afterwards 
has out of date and over framed to the defense. Well, let's take stock and see where we are. Effective overall regulation of a profession is not simply a question of having a rule. Rules made are part of a collection of forces that determine how well a profession serves its public. In a way, the rule book is the last force in the line, the long stop. First in line should be the culture established by the body itself, maintained perhaps over centuries. Once in the profession, the culture should be more significant than the rule book that should, for the most part, respect what the culture would itself dictate. It would be a poor profession where instinct went one way and the rules the other. Now, for the bar at present, there's been, as I said, a lot of change. Some of it imposed by the Legal Services Act, and the bar, unfortunately, although not the main target for legislative reform, has never been that good at change. And its culture has been determined significantly by the bodies that represent it. Those bodies, the forums of court to each of which one barrister must, must belong, find it hard to think as one. They can't understand that they should be formed into a single university body the better to stop the solicitors eating the work of the bar. Uh, they have, astonishingly, the ends of court. They have no lay representation on their governing bodies. They don't publish their accounts. You don't know how they elect the people who run these important bodies that provide barristers, advocates um, to the public. But these things, structural things matter. And the barrister in a modern world is affected by the environment and approaches taken by the bodies that run his profession. So it's hardly surprising that barristers have been slow to reform if those bodies themselves needed reform. Most recently, and it's uh, probably in the newspapers, the barristers are refusing to cooperate with the scheme to be professionally, uh, to be assessed as to their professional ability as advocates. The only scheme that we could devise, because I was on the Bar Standards Board until the end of last year, was one that may be imperfect and was operated by judges, but nevertheless, the Bar is currently in conflict with that requirement, despite the fact that for years, school teachers, surgeons, are all assessed annually. And then, of course, there's a problem so far as the bar is concerned with fees, you may think, because at the one end, and this is one of the many problems facing the bar, you've got people taking millions of pounds a year, literally, and at the other end, you've got people serving the criminal bar, the, the, the criminal cases and the family cases on public funds which pay insufficient to live on. And it always occurs to me as problematic in a regulatory setting and in a cultural setting that the person who is paid very highly, not just the standard fee, um, must be subject to temptations. And is there not indeed a problem with such barristers being affected by the very sources of the money that come to them? Some of you will know also of what are called no-win, no-fee cases, where barristers can get double fees, or could, so when it comes to settle a case where you'll get double your fee until the point of settlement, will you advise the client that in fact he's got a reasonably good case or will you say this is a great settlement to take? Of course it corrupted the barristers. And all these factors, unhelpful and helpful, have to be borne in mind. Let's now go back to Jersey to another problem before we move to international courts. This throws light on regulation from an unusual point of view. The Jersey case lasted several weeks and ran smoothly enough. If you read the transcript, you may be forgiven for thinking that the two jurats and I needed matters dealing with in evidence that weren't being de dealt with. And on either side, so far as the main defendant and accountant was concerned, there's no complaint of my conduct of the case um, in a very intimate court where there'd been calls for concern well, sorry, big pardon, where had there been cause for concern, you would have expected it to be raised formally or informally, and there were English barristers there sitting beside Jersey advocates. The Jersey advocates were the only ones allowed to speak. The main defendant was convicted. His co-accused office manager, a woman, was acquitted by the jurats. 
In the Court of Appeal, unknown to me, a complaint was made about the number of questions I'd asked and the tone or manner of them, sarcastic, and all sorts of terrible things were alleged. The Court of Appeal that sits in Jersey and included one of the senior judges of the island who probably knew the accused counsel and with whom I spoke on a daily basis throughout the trial had nothing to say about the offensive manner but said I'd asked too many questions. They dismissed the appeal nevertheless. Questions by me were of course for the reasons given. They weren't being explored in court and they were asked on my behalf but also on behalf of the two jurats who were sitting with me because they weren't allowed to speak themselves. The second stage of appeal was to the Privy Council, composed of the country's most senior Supreme Court judges, Lord Phillips, Lord Newberger, Lord Brown and Baroness Hale and one other who's now dead. They were addressed by two advocates, neither of whom had been in the trial court, one of whom was the Attorney General for the island, appearing for the prosecution. The allegation of offensive tone was revived and probably enhanced by advocates who were probably known personally to the judges of the court, none of whom knew me. I can't know what happened in the Privy Council because the Privy Council declined to provide me with a transcript or a tape recording. In its judgment, published in a newspaper without warning, I was condemned as the worst known form of judge and the appeal was allowed. The judgment in the form of Lord Brown was so fashioned as to destroy the judge, me, and could easily have led to tragedy. I chose a different course and wrote to the court, stating that they were completely wrong. I was told the judge affected had no part to play. They acted on submissions. They had nothing to say. I wrote again, setting out in detail the many obvious points that should have alerted them to reasons why they should have been more cautious about what they were being told. I was told to go away procedurally, somewhat condescendingly, as they, there was nothing they were able or willing to do. And there was nothing I could do for a time. The defendant had to be left to have his retrial and any further correspondence or efforts by me to understand what had gone so completely wrong would harm his interest. Eventually I discovered that at his retrial he pleaded guilty and would not be in front of the Privy Council again. So I wrote to the only person who might be able to offer a detached view, counsel for the co-accused, do you remember? That defendant had been acquitted. This advocate, a woman who'd been an academic in Ireland and England before spending a couple of decades as an advocate in the courts of Jersey, appearing in one court or other pretty well every day of the week, had represented her client with industry, always prepared, always asking pertinent questions and being able to answer the questions asked of her by the court. And curiously enough, a couple of weeks ago, by chance I met somebody who described her as a person who gave measured judgments. Apart from seeing her in court, I had no knowledge of her. She wrote back, clearly relieved at being approached. The case as described in the Privy Council judgment was unrecognisable as the case she'd sat through. The judgment was a character assassination. She explained in some detail how it was that the jurats and I had been left to ask questions that could or should have been asked by counsel for the other parties in a jurisdiction where until a very recent change in the law Many professionals in Jersey had been in a position to make very comfortable livings out of the lax laws on finance, some of the issues we were anxiously exploring. She explained that I had conducted the hearings with absolute courtesy from first to last. She was happy for her letter to go to the Privy Council, an obvious risk to her own career and indeed to speak to them if asked. They never asked. They had the letter. To which the reply was much as before, save that they acknowledged that her view of the proceedings was much like mine. They didn't acknowledge the possibility of error or identify a mechanism for putting error right. I was able to circulate her letter to lawyers and judges known to me. Some of them in very senior positions were concerned and wrote to the Privy Council after a long time. 
they received an answer that procedures could not change, but that if she, that's procedures for considering matters, but that if she, Ms Fogarty, the defence advocate, was right, they were wrong. Now, the people who wrote to the Privy Council had status they could not reject. This tells us a lot about our society. To me, nothing. To them, the potential for fallibility. Two of the uh, senior lawyers then wrote an article published in the Times that corrected the history. I wrote once more, setting out the manifest errors revealed in the process to date, suggesting steps that might be taken, including the referring the whole unhappy history for review to the Ministry of Justice. Lord Phillips, then the land's top judge, replied saying he consulted the two top judges in Northern Ireland and Scotland. And, perhaps unsurprisingly, they didn't think that such judges' decisions should be subject to any review. I have no doubt where the truth lies, and there are many very obvious arguments about substance and procedure that can be advanced in criticism of the Privy Council's conduct. They are set out in some detail in the correspondence that I will in due course publish. But the two most obvious ones, apart from the establishment simply protecting itself, are that the Privy Council was prepared to leave unresolved a possible injustice without checking on the evidence. Ms Fogarty, the measured experienced advocate, or the tapes that could show exactly how the trial was conducted. Instead, they chose to rely on transcripts and representations by people who weren't even in court, the ones who addressed them. And despite the fact that the Privy Council had itself said uh, you shouldn't, in another case, you've got to be quite careful about relying on transcripts because they don't actually show how a case was conducted. Is this important? Yes. Um, not just because of me or other judges, and many of them consigned to, out of, consigned to outer darkness by incorrect judgments of senior courts. Supreme courts in our land and all around the world are extremely important places for their citizens. Us typically deal with issues of life, death, health, liberty of the subject, and so on. But they may become even more important with politicians un unable these days to deal with critical issues, in particular with the ever-widening gap in wealth. Such top courts may find themselves becoming so important that they may be asked to deal with the separation of citizens by wealth in the way that American courts were asked to, and did, deal with separation of citizens by colour. Supreme courts need to be properly equipped for a modern age. They cannot expect to sit at the top of a machine that is itself subject to review and regulation in various ways without being in any way exposed themselves. Lower level judges are regulated by higher courts. Something has to be done for the Supreme Court. To have them exempt is extraordinary, especially when they recognise their shortcomings in at least two ways. This is almost funny, but not quite. Baroness Hale, the only lady judge on the Supreme Court, said, we are not final because we are right. We are right because we are final, meaning that we may be wrong and there's nothing you can do about it. She also said, very recently, judges who have risen through the bar, the temples and other parts of the establishment are not always ideally placed to cast judgment on the complexities of modern life. If the lifeblood of the law is, is experience and common sense, those then whose experience and common sense are we talking about? Surely it cannot only be the experience and common sense of the judges, many of whom have led such sheltered lives. Well. In my case, or the case in which I was concerned, application of common sense would have alerted the court as a minimum to the risk of their being grossly unfair. The Supreme Court is regulated to an extent, by the way, this may amuse you. They now have to have an application process. I was told you can no longer just get tapped on the shoulder. 
I was told by somebody that a court of appeal judge, knowing that there had to be a written application, wrote a letter saying, I am available. Old presumptions probably die hard. How should we regulate the infallible, and this is a much more general significance, but let's look at the, the, the infallible court we have here before we turn to international courts to avoid this sort of misfortune happening to others. Recently, a man called Lord Sumption was promoted straight from the ranks of the bar to the Supreme Court. It's not unprecedented, but it hasn't happened for a long time. And it may be that the time has come for the appointments committee that makes appointments to the Supreme Court to encourage applicants and uh, barristers and solicitors of diverse back backgrounds. Baroness Hale's the only woman on the Supreme Court, nobody from an ethnic minority. They should encourage people with more radical approaches to the law than the peas in the pod that some say they have. The committee, at least the lay members of the appointing committee, would probably be astonished and delighted to find, say, a high street solicitor, especially if non-white, non-Anglo-Saxon, having the qualifications to sit as a Supreme Court judge, bringing common sense and an entirely different perspective to the major legal issues of the day. Another way to secure some form of control over the over-homogeneous bench might be to have lay assessors, not unlike jurors, sitting with them. Of course, selection would be difficult, and they wouldn't be able to ask questions, they wouldn't be involved in the judgment. But the lay view, with an ability to prod the justices into asking questions not asked by counsel, could be invaluable for justice. After all, those people who've dared to challenge the establishment view and speak to me about the case concerning me have commented, why weren't you asked? Why wasn't Miss Fogarty approached? Why weren't the tapes listened to? Obvious enough to most lawyers, school teachers, university lecturers, acupuncturists, Everyone, but not to our leaders, legal leaders in chief. Enough. Let's now turn to the international courts, um, because we say, may see some of these problems appearing, but in different settings. Because international courts, which I've dealt with in the earlier lectures, also have infallible courts, but at the top, usually of two tiers. In one civil international court, there's only one tier. They're not subject, these top courts, to any review of fact or law. So that if one court renders a decision in law moderating the test of criminal liability, as was thought to happen recently on the issue of aiding and abetting, or on the vital issue of whether there is or is not a defense of superior orders, the other courts are free to disagree. What does the soldier do? Which law does he follow? And what if a top-tier court makes a decision, as we've discussed in earlier lectures, because of local political pressure? Should the rest of the world's jurisprudence be affected by the local interest? But there are, of course, other greater problems that need regulation in the international courts, which are staffed on the basis of what the UN calls geographical spread. No two judges from the same country. Lawyers and other staff all selected to ensure that as many countries as possible have their nationals engaged at the court. On the bench, the judges sit in three, fours and fives, having no shared background and often no common language. Many rumours of them barely being on speaking terms, hardly surprising. Many, most lawyers, will have relocated often with families from thousands of miles away. What can they do if their boss puts them under pressure to do something wrong? If they don't comply, no promotion, they may lose their job, children, family relocated back thousands of miles, no job to go to. If they do comply with the pressure improperly imposed on them, promotion, favour, etc. And <clears throat> how would that experience compare with what happens here with the independent sole practitioners, sometimes we're described hired gun advocates, well, the independent lawyer may be tempted to do the wrong thing, may even be sorely tempted. But if he does, he knows his one saleable item 
his reputation is at risk. And it's perhaps not surprising that in the Yugoslav tribunal where I was engaged, when it was necessary to challenge uh, management over improper pressure, it was more often the common lawyers from England and Australia uh, and sometimes America who were prepared to challenge and the others were not. These are all realities of being a lawyer in a modern and complex world. Let me tell you the worst example that I had on this topic. Seven days before the end of the prosecution's case in the Milosevic trial, it became clear that the presiding judge, Sir Richard May from England, had a very serious medical problem. He was persuaded to go to the doctor and it was confirmed how ill he was, and very sadly he died shortly thereafter. The ICT, with the Yugoslav Tribunal's rules, allowed a panel of three judges to sit with one member absent, i.e. just two of the others sitting, for up to, day, up to five days, but only if his absence, that is the missing judge, was likely to be of short duration. Otherwise, the hearings had to stop forthwith. All three supposedly independent parts of that tribunal, judges, prosecutor, and the registry who run the, the show, thought it would be a good idea to close the prosecution case by squeezing seven days' evidence into five without alerting Milosevic to the gravity of Judge May's illness or thus to the illegality of the proceedings before only two judges. We all knew there was no possibility of Judge May's medical condition fitting into the short duration description. It wasn't possible. The hearings had to stop. But it was thought that by doing this, a great PR coup could be achieved. The prosecution's case could be brought to an end. It was also thought they could go even further and allow the two judges to deal with the very important submissions made in writing at the end of the prosecution's case on behalf of Milosevic uh, without alerting him or anyone else to the fact that Judge May wasn't taking part. How silly. Another judge was going to have to read in in any event, and Judge Lord Bonamy from Scotland did, and did it excellently. And it would have been far better for him to have heard the last seven days of evidence. But never mind. That didn't happen. Ironically, it seems to me, had Milosevic been informed of what was happening, what was actually happening of Judge May's ill health, he would probably have said, I couldn't care less. You can try me with two judges and a member of the animal kingdom. Such is my respect for your court. But he was never told. He was kept in the dark. I had no choice but to say that the plan was wrong. I was subject to extreme pressure, not just from the prosecutor's office, to shut up. I declined. I was advised by another UK lawyer to do what I already knew was appropriate, namely to come to my own professional conduct body, who confirmed that I had to get off the case unless I could put it right. And here, of course, regulation, rules, can serve in defence of and protection of the professional, as well as in uh, ways of trying to uh, bring him to book and sometimes punish him. There was nowhere in the United Nations to turn for assistance. There is no effective code of conduct for prosecuting lawyers. I contacted the Foreign and Commonwealth Office's top lawyer, who'd been much involved in creation of these um, tribunals, and asked him, what can you do to make this court behave properly? I found him in Arusha. I mean, I didn't find him, I found him on the end of a phone in Arusha. To which his answer was, you're on your own. There was a meeting uh, uh, of um, senior lawyers. Most of them had offered papers inclining to the view that, yes, it, what was being planned was wrong, although the very ambitious might have been saying that it was all possible. But nevertheless, they all really knew it was wrong. I was accused of blackmail by the prosecutor for having gone to my professional body. Not a term I took to very kindly. And so I left that room. And... Uh, took drastic action that eventually put the problem right. And here's the reality of trying to run an ethical profession. Those employed lawyers stayed behind, they said, to temporise. None of them came up with me. And yet they all knew that what was going on was completely wrong. Well, it wasn't possible to remove me from the case, much though that was contemplated and tried. 
I was detested for having put the law above short-term exigencies. Such is the reality of working in frontier legal uh, systems that are neither accountable nor regulated. The lessons from this account are perhaps obvious, but let me deal with them in my final stock take. Regulation like law is about getting people to behave well, to be good. We don't know what goodness is, we don't know whether we are good or bad, but we do know that individuals all have their personal sense of goodness from which they should not be detached without good reason. Clever law and clever regulation activates that sense of goodness personal sense to achieve what society wants and not necessarily simply by a rule book because rules are to be broken. How do we regulate human interaction and professional advice as a lawyer is a form of interaction? See it as an art and think of the examples for yourself. At the one end there are the limited instances where there is no regulation of behaviour beyond what the nation's laws provide. Maybe queuing for buses, swimming in the sea, playing games in a park. We trust each other. But there aren't many examples of this. At the other end, there is fierce regulation, and you may expect me to say rape, murder. No. The fiercest, the most interesting example of regulation in a domestic setting are the drink drive laws. We all know it's dangerous to drive and drunk. We believe that over the last 40 years, we have changed the culture. We believe our children genuinely would never drive with alcohol. Take the laws away tomorrow, and we will be back to saying, oh, I think three pints and a couple of glasses of wine swilling around in my inside, and I can still get home safely. So we have to have very fierce rules for n not the gravest of offenses, because we know not only that the behavior has to be stopped, but that people have to be um, have their temptation controlled. And you can find examples of this in regulation of uh, professionals. For example, continuing professional development. We all know in every profession that we should go out and study the up-to-date subject of our profession. But we also all know that if we are given a chance to put it off to next year, the year after, and the year after that, we will. So we have to have, for this sort of problem of a profession, which is not the heart of the profession, we have to have fierce regulation. But if you look at the examples I gave you um, from personal experience, the man who did or didn't hand over the statement, the judge who got it wrong, the judge who uh, got the law wrong and I nearly got it wrong, all that sort of thing, none of those, not one of them, apart possibly from the judge who let the two policemen into his room in private, uh, would have been any different by greater acquaintance with the rule book. Everybody knew what the rules said. But for one reason or another, good, bad, indifferent and uncertain, the rules were overridden. And so what you have to do, it seems to me, with um, regulation or modern regulation is to find systems that can rely on people's sense of goodness, activate it, and get them to act in a way that conforms with what the professional demands are. And you know, I think that we've um, had the perfect example uh, of, how, of, of regulation that didn't work in the last few years in this country. Perfect example. Hundreds, over a thousand, I think, parliamentarians had their expenses challenged. At one end, you had people who were completely without risk or fear. They claimed nothing, they travelled on second-class trains, they cleaned their own moats. At the other end, we know that there were people who knew full well that what they were doing was dishonest by any stretch of the imagination. But in the middle, believe me, many, many very worried parliamentarians. Some thinking, well, Bob Mellish MP said, add to your salary by claiming on expenses. And I think that's about right. Some thought, well, the officials have said, you can do this, and so I will build my goose house, shall we say. Uh, I'm not quite sure about it. 
had there been a practice introduced on the very day that Bob Mellish said whatever he did, that every parliamentary expenses claim would be publicly available, subject to necessary excision of certain details, nobody would have been convicted. Either because they would have been too frightened to cheat, or because their sense of goodness would have been activated, their image would have been enhanced, and their disgrace and our society's disgrace would have been avoided. But it wasn't a rule. It wouldn't have been a rule. It would have been a practice. And somehow, in a modern profession like the bar is at the moment under very considerable pressure, we have to find ways of creating systems like that that can solve the problems that the poor old bar is facing. The bar's been subject to some unwanted um, controls. I told you about the quality assessment, which they, they are seriously resisting. And they haven't been good at uh, responding to what society may want of them. But the super regulator has got things really badly wrong as well. And going back to one of the things I said right at the beginning, to me, it seems, completely inappropriate for professional bodies to have a lay majority. It announces we don't trust ourselves. Of course you have to have lay representation because lay representation does two things, but lay majority? I don't think so. The new profession of intergalactic pilots, 13 of them, meet together. Their first decision is to find 14 lay members to overrule them. No, that is not a profession. And whatever else is happening under the auspices of the Legal Standards Board, I hope that we will move to the position, whether the Legal Standards Board stays in office, stays in position or not, where the majority uh, rule will go. Because the professions should be trusted. It's what I said right at the beginning. The Legal Services Board also misses some very obvious points known to professionals and understood by us. I don't know if you know about these things. Um, referral fees. People trade in litigation cases. The Legal Services Board doesn't seem to understand that that means the cost goes up because each person takes just a small percentage in the middle, thank you very much, and up it goes. Also, of course, that by trading in these cases, you deny the litigant the very best choice um, of advocate that he might want. Third, the, the Legal Services Board, and this is all, I think, a reflection of the danger of having lay people with insufficient experience dealing with uh, complex professional matters, they have no idea what the cab rank rule is. Well, you may not either. But the cab rank rule is the rule that the barrister doesn't choose his case. The client chooses the barrister. The barrister's n available uh, and able to do that sort of work and the money, the appropriate fee can be paid. The litigant can have who he wants. It was said very famously by uh, Erskine in a trial hundreds of years ago now that when the lawyer chooses his client rather than the other way around, the liberties of England are at an end. The Legal Standards Board doesn't quite seem to understand that. But as I say, the bar has not been very um, responsive to change. You can sympathise with the bar, I think, considerably because they've got a huge amount that has uh, happened to them in the last few years, or last few decades, I suppose. They've seen their monopoly of rights of audience go. They've seen um, their legal aid work rise, fall in quantity and fees. They've seen their work go to institutions like the Crown Prosecution Service, and now they find themselves forced. When finances are difficult for the poorer end of the bar, they find themselves having to operate in ways that they never contemplated when they came to the bar. But they are there to serve the public. And it is immensely unfortunate for the public and for the bar that the bar wasn't recognizing 20, 30 years ago 
the direction in which society would move. The present battle between some parts of the bar and the bar standards board about assessment of performance, which you may read about in the newspapers, as you read about it, ask yourself the question, how different would this have been had the bar introduced a voluntary system of kite marking or testing yourselves 20, 30 years ago? They'd never have been in this position. Instead of that, they had the arrogance, unfortunately, to hang on until the last minute, and now they find themselves in great difficulties. And I can say this because when I came to the bar first, um, I came from a short period in, 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 in industry. And I was amazed, I thought, gosh, don't we ever get corrected? Don't we ever get tested? And I said this to another chap who was a couple of years older than me, not a, a highfalutin uh, background at all, rather ordinary or even working class. And he said, no, 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 no. Barristers don't get regulated. It's not, not regulated. We wouldn't have used that word. No, no, there's no need for a barrister in his entire life to be reviewed. Funny, huh? Let me end in this way, because I can see that time's running out and you may have questions you want to raise. Being a barrister, being any form of advocate within a legal system, is to have the enormous privilege of representing another human being at a point of distress in that human being's life, whoever she or he is. It is a privilege shared with doctors and priests. It is a privilege that should reflect by the conduct of the professionals and by the regulation to which the profession may have to be subject, that lawyers and judges work in the service of the citizen, not the other way around. I'm pretty well out of time, but I'll take questions if there are any. But before I do, in case you, any of you start running, not running away, leaving. Um, legal, I've, this is the last of my six lectures of this year, and I'm in the process of writing uh, the program for next year. Legal topics of interest to the general um, listener uh, are sometimes difficult to identify. So if any of you has any particular topic arising from what we've discussed or you've heard about this year or anything that's on your mind and you want to let us know through the office, I would be grateful. I can't guarantee it will form the subject of part or all of a lecture, but it would not be unhelpful to know if there's anything that you think might be an interesting lecture. There's a question here. Uh, I was quite interested by your Pete Bolchin solicitor, higher rights advocate, yeah. so you can see where I'm going. I just wondered what your view is actually about uh, solicitors' rights of audience because uh, our, my understanding was from my learned friend here, Mr Lay, that Sir Fred Lawton, way back in the 80s, suggested a fused profession with some sort of uh, advocacy college, some sort of uh, judicial college and advocacy college. I'm not sure he may disagree with what, he, what, what I say. If they'd acted earlier, they may well have retained their independence, the bar, a much smaller independence with some form of grandfather rights for those already in. And obviously solicitors who wish to then do advocacy would have, would have progressed as they saw, foot, saw, saw, saw fit and cut off at the point they saw fit. For instance, I quite like muddling around the magistrate's court, doing the odd appeal in mm. the Crown Court. Really all I want to do, directions, PTRs. I'm not really interested in addressing a jury. In my specialist area, I'm interested in going now and again to the so Crown Court. So your question is? So the question is, what is your view? You know, because obviously you're a, bar you're a barrister, I'm a solicitor, you know? I, I, it was slightly loaded when you said about, you know, they were worried about solicitors coming in and eating up all their work. I don't see it myself, but I'd be interested to know what no. your view is about. Uh, I'm not actually particularly uh, convinced that barristers are entitled to remain or should remain a separate profession. I think that there are advantages in advocates um, retaining many of the features of the, some of the features of the bar, the cab rank rule, the independence, the, the ability to hand the papers back when someone tries to pressure you, the ability to go and beat the judge up if he does it wrong without fear of what's going to happen to your company, uh, your, your, your firm. So, 
I don't really mind too much about solicitors and barristers. What I think is really important is that advocates may benefit from having an identity um, where they can discover what their true mission um, as a profession is. At the moment, there is no very clear um, identification of what a barrister is or indeed what a solicitor advocate is. And the Bar Standards Board's been trying to identify this, but it's not for them, it's really for the Bar Council. The Bar Council needs to represent everyone, employed barristers, um, self-employed uh, barristers, sole practitioners, the rich, the poor, and can't really uh, find uh, a way out of this particular problem of identification. So I don't have a strong view against you, not against you, against that idea. I do think that we need to identify what an advocate does and try and have that available to all the, as, as a principle for regulation to all those who do it. Yeah, I'm worried about advocacy in solicitors firms, most certainly. And I think uh, that's what, that is a worry of mine. Okay. Can we just, you, I'll come back to you, of course, in yeah. a second, but yes, sir. I'd, 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 I'd love to be able to provide an answer. I'd love to be able to provide an answer to that. I have no experience of being an accountant, but I think generally, and I, all I can say is this: if you look around all the problems we've surveyed in the twelve, in the six lectures I've given, particular problems and the problems today, many of them would be um, avoided if there was much more availability and entitlement to information. And there may be reasons why in an accounting firm staff has to remain confidential. But really, on matters of public interest, we should be moving to the position where the expectation is that you have a right to know. And once you have a right to know, if you like my example about the parliamentarians who found themselves so embarrassed at being close to temptation, that's another example. Um, I, I think that what we should be working for generally is the, the right to know. I think the gentleman here. Sir, I've no direct connection with the legal profession, but I have appeared as an expert witness. And my conclusion was neither side, whether I was linked to the prosecution, the defense, was the slightest bit interested in the truth. They were doing the best for their client. You're completely right. And many people would say, you're completely right, and that's the way it should be, that uh, adversarial trials are not trials about truth, they're trials about proof. Uh, the consequence of which is that you can have two sides advancing versions of events, neither of which is correct. And the only question of which is, which one will win? Now, it would be a pretty um, uh, radical thing to say in this country that the adversarial system may have to go. But as a matter of logic, its utility is probably in some ways time limited. It came some, a judge who I sat with on the very first day, I did any training of anyone, suggested I think to the policeman he was training at the time that the reason you had the burden of proof, the standard of proof from this adversarial system was because conviction had such grave consequences, cutting your head off or that sort of thing, for a minor offence, that therefore it was sensible and fair that you should have a very, 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 very high test, which was a game that could be played. That's all gone. And we are much more sophisticated, and I think the time may have come, indeed, when, I, I don't suggest it, but someone will suggest that the adversarial system may need reconsideration. Yes. Um, uh, 
I would like to ask you uh, on basis of what um, um, this gentleman accountant said is about uh, uh, obvious interest in his profession, accountant profession in money. And you mentioned it in your lecture as well uh, about advocates, um, barristers. And uh, there is a certain sort of ideology of greed that is identified in the seven last years, what mm. drives our uh, society. And you actually identified another um, important issue. And you, you mentioned something like um, our sense of goodness, which is ethical problem. And what I see here is that is, is actually sort of a collision between uh, ideology of greed that is now measurable and is a reflection of how we measure success. And how would you combine these two? And what would be your, how, how could you make uh, goodness as a principle more, um, more uh, concrete? Well, it's immensely difficult as a problem. But if you have, if you have, um, uh, a society of professionals, like ours might be, which had, it doesn't, a very simple philosophy. Put the battles of others first, supposing that was its philosophy. And if that philosophy was acceptable to the profession as a whole, then you probably don't need so much rules as to drive people to follow that as a guiding principle you need it to be known that that is the principle of this elite. That's why I turn to the question of an elite. Um, it may be fanciful, but I don't think it is, that if you instill in people, like whether <laughs> the examples I gave with the SAS on the one side and Gaddafi's uh, defenders on the other, but if you instill in people that there are some principles that are so important that they cannot be set aside and if you can identify the principles that drive the bar, then that is the way you activate someone's sense of goodness. Coming to your first point, is this inevitably, necessarily, and unavoidably in conflict with the philosophy of financial greed that operates? My view, yes. Uh, I believe, as I implied, that there may be an argument for saying that you shouldn't have a, an open market in fees for barristers, you should have standard fees in some way. Because once you go over a certain limit of earnings, and we know of some cases in the last few years, once you go over a certain limit of earnings, then the temptations to corrupt what you do because of the income is enormous. I think I should also have said, I ran out of time, but I think that the bar um, is, has been terribly unwise in suppressing from the public its real earnings. Um, the, the information's available to the bar. It uh, comes, or technically available, through the mutual insurance company, in which you have to declare your income. You don't necessarily need to know the names of the people who, own, who, who receive 3 million, 2 million, 1 million, or the people who receive... 30,000 a year, which is an earned income, is the equivalent of 15. But there's no reason I can see why a profession that serves the public interest shouldn't make clear at least the bands of wealth that uh, lawyers are taking out of the system. But, as I also ventured to suggest, we may be moving to societies where the increasing separation of wealth is beyond the control of politicians or regulators. Sir. Is, is there a way uh, for someone who has no legal training to take, something, to take a case to, to the court, yes. uh, who has not sufficient funds to convince a barrister to take the case forward? Um, is there a way for Yes, people can, you can, of course you can go to court, you may have to pay the court fees yourself. Um, and it's increasingly uh, the experience of advocates that they have to deal with unrepresented litigants. It's increasingly the case in the first level appeal court. What I find slightly disturbing is that the judges and practitioners speak of this in unfavorable terms. Say, so, yeah, it's so much better if you've got somebody who's represented, so much more difficult. Well, I'm sorry, it's society that's created the circumstances 
where the law is too expensive or where there is no legal aid. And therefore, everything should be done for the um, unrepresented litigant to make his way. And there are plenty of organisations in the Royal Courts of Justice, Citizens Advice Bureau and elsewhere, which will give you assistance. Mm -hmm. well, the Sorry, I can't hear you. I think the, the government were thinking of cutting the CAB professional uh, yes. uh, budget, weren't they, for the Royal Courts of Justice CAB? Yeah. I mean, it's going to end up in chaos, I think, not before long, because 20 or 30 percent of the Court of Appeal are litigants in person at the moment. Yes. Um, and I don't think the judges are particularly happy about it all. And that's not me them being patronising or condescending, it's just it takes a lot longer to deal, mm. I think, with people who are unrepresented. Not that they don't try. No, quite right. I think we're running out of time, but there was a gentleman at the back who had a question. Just two, two really short questions, please. The, the, first is, the first is this. Do you think that the miscarriages of justice that you spoke of in the 70s and 80s have gone or changed? It seemed to me, watching the, the, the riots, the disorder, a year ago, 18 months ago, that people were being shepherded towards conviction. I don't know what your opinion is about that. The second point is, aren't you troubled by the, the, the smaller and smaller range of people who are being allowed to qualify as solicitors or barristers? It seems to me that both professions are responding to the pressure of places by excluding large numbers of people, and that's wrong. Uh, to both questions, I uh, would, would say yes. Dealing with the second, the forbidding debt that students have to uh, face, even to qualify as a first degree, let alone to get a professional qualification, is of course um, changing our profession, but other professions, into increasingly middle class or even rich um, background uh, professions. And that's unhealthy for society. How you deal with it is not a problem for the particular profession I, on this topic, the inns, even if they don't act collectively, um, at least they do as much as they can by way of scholarships. Your first point is, I think, an immensely uh, interesting point, because it's a point that society will never willingly embrace. I approach it in this way. I'll come back to the, the the miscarriages of justice in the 1970s just at the end. We all know that if the children of the South London estates had at birth been swapped with the children of the Gloucestershire ruling class, then the Gloucestershire ruling class babies would have rioted and the South London children would not. We can't face this um, because the only way you can face it is by recognizing that society is not that determined to control crime. It lives with crime. There are mechanisms, no doubt unappealing, for those who wish to be very rich or those who see the advantages of divided societies. There are processes which can reduce the crime that follows um, poor distribution of wealth amongst the society. But that's not going to happen. And that's why I suggested that the Supreme Courts need to be broadened in their composition because it may be to them that the boys from South London will have to say, or the boys and girls from South London will have to say, sorry, what your government is doing is now beyond the law because it is actually creating two classes of society. Coming back to your, your very first point about um, uh, miscarriages of justice, uh, there were many, and they certainly led to some significant reforms, uh, all to the good. The reforms were, just as with other regulatory procedures I've been dealing with, mostly procedural, you've got to disclose this kind of information to your opponent, whatever else it may be. Um, 
the problem with things going wrong, or things being wrong, is that you don't know what's there until it emerges. So, although it would be nice to think our legal system is now free of those flaws and free of any others, unless we are absolutely ruthless in sorting out, limita uh, sorting out problems, sorting out limitations in our judges as well as in our lawyers and in our systems, we may, of course, lull ourselves into the security that will allow that sort of problem, but in another way, to arise. I think I've probably trespassed on the patience of the staff long enough. Um, uh, thank you all very much for staying with such interesting questions, and maybe I'll see you next year, maybe to deal with topics that you might choose to identify of interest to you. Thank you very much.